but spent a lot of time in nightlife working at restaurants clubs working as a bouncer working as security being in nightlife is like it takes away the sort of judgment aspect of people judging you as individually but also it's you know from being locked up i did want to see people and meet people so this barbershop in particular happened to be a, a barbershop that's open after hours and me being on a nighttime schedule much of the time, I uh, was happy about that. One night, a former barber of mine had recognized me. Not too long after, the barber that was supposed to cut my hair, he comes out and says, yeah, is all that stuff about you true? Are you from Chicago and this and that? Are you HIV positive? I said, I say, yeah. My father was born in Chicago, and he was from Chicago, and his mother was in Chicago. So that's who I grew up with, mostly him and his mother. You know, ironically, a lot of people kind of pushed me to play basketball because, you know, given the fact that I was about six foot one when I was 11 or 12 years old, people saw that I, I'd probably be a good specimen for basketball. Me personally, I liked to watch basketball. I liked it, but I always wanted to do other things. I ended up at some point during my junior year getting expelled from St. Patrick's High School for missing class. From there, I kind of lost my, my ability to go to a, a top school. I was invited to a Lola Park in a park league. Randy Brown's cousin at the time, who was a basketball agent, an NBA basketball scout, that was his alma mater. Also ran the park where I used to play at. So it, it was me staying close to home from a distance. I will say that South Dakota is, in my opinion, it was one of the least diverse um, states that I've ever been in. You're in a town where there's only one of everything pretty much. So it, it, in many ways, a lot of my teammates were outsiders. So I don't know what, what counseling involves. I don't think I've ever really formally been in HIV counseling. Um, but that was what they were providing, I guess. I was told that there's a possibility that something might be wrong and they had to retest me. The Red Cross official, along with the Department of Health, their approach for me was more along the lines of like epidemiologists. You donated blood, but there's a problem with your donation in that sense. I was handed a paper almost immediately of a law written in 2000 called Intentional Exposure to HIV. I looked at it, the penalty on, in this law was like what my prognosis was. If they were gonna be offering a year for it, then I felt like obviously I would be living pretty long, but it's still, you know, a problematic situation. So I felt that the time correlates very closely with my prognosis. I can't imagine how someone can process information about a new HIV diagnosis and HIV criminalization at the same time. Um, I just can't imagine how one can physically do that. And so when you know, a young 19-year-old man like Nico is told that he might be HIV positive, you know, the thing that he holds on to for dear life is the word might. That is so far outside of, kind of any best practice that probably has ever been around <laughs> related to public health. It's kind of astonishing. The idea that, you know, Nico at the end of it felt like, you know, the option that I have after my HIV diagnosis was prison, I think that that was meant to feel that way. What you care more about is what he does after this with other people than him and his health, to me also speaks about the systems and who they care about. Well, immediately I said, I would, I would never have sex again, like I told, I told them. And it made me feel sad because 
they were reminding me kind of of what I felt was <laughs> the, the main problem with being positive is that I was going to be treated differently. There's also a possibility that I wasn't positive because I was still healthy and I was still strong. I was stronger, more fit, and and I didn't have any symptoms. So, so it was a possibility in my head that there was a mistake. And I hope that there was a mistake. I hope that it wasn't true. This small private school of 400 students is in shock after 18-year-old basketball player Nico Ritaramas was charged with five counts of intentional exposure to HIV infection. The authorities say they believe at least 50 other people may have been exposed to HIV, the AIDS virus, through Mr. Ritaramas and two unidentified young women he had sex with. In all, four people here, including Mr. Vitaramas, have tested positive for the virus. An associate pastor is behind bars tonight, accused of knowingly transmitting HIV. A man described by prosecutors as a serial transmitter of HIV is free on bond tonight. A high school student accused of trying to give a man HIV. It, it, is, a, it is a difficult situation we create when we make a person's health condition then the, uh, an element of a crime. Daniel Cleves is accused of knowingly transmitting HIV to a When there are, is an HIV criminalization Cleaves, arrest, that person is often used. Lee Park works at Fellowship United Church Their of face Christ is in flashed across the news. People in the community are told, if you've had uh, intimate contact with this person, you need to contact us. So the police use it as an investigative tool. And unfortunately, I think, um, sometimes public health Officials see this as an opportunity. 18-year-old Nico Brito Ramos was the first person in South Dakota charged with intentionally exposing someone to the virus that causes AIDS. More than 200 people in Huron were tested for HIV. In the first couple of weeks when I was arrested, the governor at the time, Bill Jenklo, started making comments that what I did was no different than taking a gun and pulling the trigger. There was the assumption, it seemed, that I was the cause of or the you know patient zero of South Dakota, or patient zero of Huron. They feel like they're successful because they've gotten a whole bunch of people to test, most of whom have had no contact with this individual. They create this fear of contagion, and fear is a very strong motivator. If you're serious about ending the AIDS epidemic, what is the first step? The first step is to increase the incentives for people to come in and find out they're HIV positive. So what does criminalization does? It actually dramatically decreases your incentive. It incentivizes you not knowing because you can't be in prison if you don't know. When you have a criminalization law as it relates to HIV, I think it further stigmatizes everything related to HIV, right? So if I know that there's a chance my freedom may be up for stakes, if I get tested, why would I do that? And I think particularly in communities of color who have such bad experiences that have been mistreated so much by the legal system that trying to engage anywhere in testing and treatment and care would become secondary or even further down the list of what's important when it comes to thinking about HIV. And so when you have criminalization laws on the book, it actually is a deterrent to getting your HIV, knowing your HIV status. That's number one. Number two, with criminalization, it creates an alienating relationship, a hostile relationship between you know, service providers and their clients. And particularly in black and brown communities where medical mistrust is already pervasive, now, you really don't need to exacerbate that problem. Number three, you know, criminalization reduces utilization and access. You know, so um, 
What happens is that people are less likely to get tested, they're less likely to seek treatment, and they're less likely uh, to adhere to the regimens they're on. Disclosure is such an intimate thing. Usually it happens between one partner and another partner, and it's just the two of them that know the truth. With HIV criminalization law, it comes down to uh, he said, she said, she said, he said, he said, he said, whatever. There becomes no real way to prove whether disclosure happened or it didn't happen. If you were confident that everyone was going to be able to take that information in without applying all of their preconceived and usually false um, ideas about HIV and how it's transmitted and what it means to live with HIV, and, um, well, then those disclosures would be easy. Britta Ramos was sentenced to four months in jail after the woman who he intentionally exposed to the disease pleaded for leniency. I stayed for a couple years. Um, I, I went back to college. I played, I tried to play college sports. I, I was actually, you know, very desirable as a, as a recruit, at least superficially, until uh, they figured out what happened to me in South Dakota. Then Chicago State University, I, I didn't go as a basketball recruit, but I ended up just matriculating into Chicago State University. Also, it bothered some of the other players maybe that we're, if I were to play the sport or that there, there'd be some sort of physical contact and some sort of, you know, potential maybe from their perspective transmission. Uh, I'm not sure exactly because I'm not operating on asking them what they're actually thinking. I'm operating on the way that the information seems to have made them kind of stay away. People started asking me, you look very familiar. Do, do I know you from somewhere or this and that? And, and also the friends I knew actually let me know how big it was. Barbershop is like the modern day men's club. If you're not accepted at the barbershop, it's like kind of like not being accepted at a party, not being accepted in a club. One night, this guy was from Chicago and happened to have come to LA and happened to have gotten a barber position at a barbershop where I was cutting my hair at. He was happy to see me, it seemed, or so interested in the issue that he, he's talking about it to the other barbers. Inside the barber shop, the barber that was supposed to cut my hair, he comes out and says, yeah, is all that stuff about you true? Are you from Chicago and this and that? Are you HIV positive? I said, I say, yeah. I can't cut your hair anymore. I have, you know, celebrity clientele and I don't want that to affect my my business. I never really wanted to be in the limelight or in front of cameras or to be publicly HIV positive. I didn't want to be a poster boy for HIV. I didn't I didn't want to be anything of that sort. I just know that it's almost necessary to get things done, that persons expose themselves 